Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're looking at the question of whether globalization is dying. The conflict in the Ukraine has made it clear that some global supply relationships may be severed for years to come. The rise of China's power and influence globally has given some reason to pause and question whether Western countries should be manufacturing in China. There's no question in my mind that globalization is changing. But the question is how? If we look at the forces that affect globalization, they're best encapsulated in the concept of the groundbreaking book called The World is Flat by Tom Friedman. This book was originally published in 2005, long before the advent of Facebook or Airbnb or Twitter or a host of other things that we now take for granted. The trends he identified in that book have played out in a way that you would think that somehow he scripted the outcome. Well, this past week, Tom Friedman spoke at the World Economic Forum in Davos on this very same question. He had some interesting perspectives that help reframe even what we mean by globalization. There have been numerous times over recent decades that the death of globalization has been predicted. It was predicted in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. My goodness, the entire financial system couldn't be trusted and banks stopped depositing funds with each other overnight. Well, if World War I didn't stop globalization and World War II didn't stop globalization, the current war in the Ukraine is not going to either. It's actually the first conflict to engage people the world over without relying on official channels. So when we speak about globalization, we need to define it a bit better. Are we talking about finance, manufacturing, travel? Are we talking about real estate or agriculture? Or how about transportation, maybe construction? See, historically, in order to act globally, you needed to be a country. Then, as the Industrial Revolution progressed, you needed to be a company. But today, and for the first time in history, it's possible for individuals to operate globally. This is a world where an entrepreneur like Elon Musk can subvert attempts by the Russian military to knock out the internet in the Ukraine. Shortly after a tweet, there's hundreds of Starlink terminals in the Ukraine, and now there's more than 10,000 Starlink terminals and another 5,000 on the way. More than 150,000 users from Ukraine are on Starlink on a daily basis. These are some of the things that governments, especially autocratic governments, have failed to understand in this new globalization. See, there are superpowers like the U.S., China, and maybe Russia, but there are also super-empowered individuals. They're not all good. An example of that would be Osama bin Laden. The seminal event was the attack on September 11, 2001. But there were previous attacks, both on the World Trade Center, on the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi and Kenya, and then many forgot that in the late 90s, the Clinton administration fired 72 cruise missiles at a compound in Afghanistan. That was a superpower taking aim at a super-empowered individual. That attack on the World Trade Center was merely revenge for the cruise missile attack in Afghanistan. But super-individuals are not all terrorists. My friend Brittany Turner has been training an entire team to perform disaster relief anywhere in the world where it's needed. She flew with her team into Tortola in 2018 when Hurricane Irma devastated the island. She went into Haiti after the earthquake. She flew a team to the Bahamas last year. She sent a team into Lake Charles, Louisiana after Hurricane Laura and again after Hurricane Delta. And now she set up an NGO to rescue children who have been orphaned by the conflict in the Ukraine. She personally, with her team, have rescued more than a thousand children and kept them out of the hands of human traffickers who could prey upon orphaned children. We have PayPal set up a system that enables PayPal users to donate directly to over 250 vetted organizations that are performing humanitarian work in the Ukraine. You can even donate your Amex reward points to an NGO of your choice in the Ukraine via PayPal. These are not corporate initiatives. This is the work of high-initiative individuals taking action on a global basis using global platforms. Early in the conflict, someone in the West rented a room on Airbnb in Lviv and then didn't use the room. They donated the funds to a family in the Ukraine using the Airbnb platform. This went viral, and within weeks, more than $20 million had been donated to people within the Ukraine over the Airbnb platform. This is the kind of thing that's possible in a modern globalized world. I have a friend who's an American who now lives in Colombia, and he operates an entire network of U.S.-based and internationally-based short-term rentals from his location in Colombia. It used to be that geography was a constraint, and it is no longer. I personally have projects in Denver, Boise, Colorado Springs, and, and many other cities, and I've developed relationships with local people without ever traveling to the property in over two years. 
So how is it possible that some dude from Ottawa, Canada can effectively undertake large-scale investments and development projects in a place he's never visited? This is what's possible in a newly globalized world. In our business, we routinely hire talent from around the world on Upwork. These small projects are often highly specialized. We hire draftsmen, rendering artists, researchers, all of this part of the new globalization. So before we declare globalization dead, we need to look deeper at what we actually mean by the word. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.